We continue talking about prokaryotic translation, and in this one, we will take a deep dive into the elongation stage. Specifically, we will discuss how correct tRNAs are paired at the A site, and how they move to the P site and then to the E site. Also, we'll talk about the peptide bond formation, and how the overall translocation or movement of the ribosome depends on some key elongation factors. So, we start where we left off in the initiation stage which is the 70S initiation complex. If you haven't watched the initiation video, I highly recommend you watch it first. The link for the initiation video is down in the description as well as in the cards on the top right. In this 70S complex, we saw that the IF3, initiation factor 3, remains paired with the 50S subunit. The AUG codon, which is the start codon, is bound by this special initiator tRNA, which contains the 4-mile methionine. We also notice that in the initiation, the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is part of the 30S subunit, pairs with the Schein-Delgarno sequence on the mRNA. And this is just around 10 nucleotides upstream of the start codon. And the A sites and P sites are empty. They're not bound by anything, while the P site is occupied by this initiator tRNA. Now, I want to introduce the docking site, which helps position the 50S subunit onto the 30S subunit by interacting with the initiation factor 2 GTP complex, which we covered in the initiation video. And this docking site is part of the BL12 protein, which is part of the 50S subunit. Now, if this 70S initiation complex were to start elongating, the first thing that should occur is the addition of a new charged tRNA at the A site. But these charged or amino acylated tRNAs by themselves cannot bind to the A site, so they need help. And we've seen this with the initiator tRNA as well, where initiation factor 2 helps in the recruitment of the FMET tRNA to the P site. For all other regular tRNAs, however, an elongation factor, EFTU, offers this help. TU here stands for thermounstable. Specifically, the elongation factor TU, when loaded with a GTP, will bind to any charged tRNA, which is not the initiator tRNA. And charge here is just another word for amino acylation. If you're unsure what this means, I recommend you watch the tRNA charging video first. So the transfer RNA that will be recruited at the A site must have anticodons that pair with the correct codons on the mRNA. The EFTU specifically recognizes the 3' prime end of the charged transfer RNA. Once this transfer RNA is bound by the elongation factor TU, this charged tRNA is recruited at the A site in such a way that the elongation factor docks itself at the docking site. By the way, this docking site is sometimes also called factor binding region. So don't be confused if you see factor binding region being used instead of the term docking site. All right, once the elongation factor TU docks or binds, the BL12 protein, which has this SRL region, which is essentially just a secondary loop structure, and this loop activates the GTPase activity of the docking site and a pyrophosphate is released from the GTP. However, this GTPase activation only occurs when the elongation factor TU has brought in the correct transfer RNA. So this pairing of codon and anticodon acts like a sensor for the GTPase activity. Now, once this pairing is established, the correct pairing between the tRNA and the mRNA at the A site, the tRNA moves about 70 angstroms towards the P site. And this movement is usually a rotation of the P-site tRNA. And this movement only happens when there is a correct pairing of the transfer RNA. And this is called accommodation. And this mechanism acts like a proofreading mechanism. So this accommodation and the docking of elongation factor TU causes the SRL loop to break a phosphate bond in the GTP, which means that the elongation factor TU has a GDP attached to it. And this EFTU GDP complex has very little affinity towards the 50S docking site. And therefore, this EFTU GDP complex is released from the 50S subunit. Now, in the next state of this complex, the tRNA at the A site is sitting quite close to the P site tRNA due to this accommodation mechanism. 
And we also notice that the EFTU is now released, so the docking region is completely empty. Another thing that happens due to the GTPase activity, which releases the energy and this moves the A site tRNA, is that the anti SD sequence in the 16S ribosomal RNA, which was paired with the mRNA, becomes unpaired. It essentially flips inside the core of the 30S subunit. And as before, the E site now is still empty. Now, another player enters this elongation process. Recall that 50S subunit has a 23S ribosomal RNA as its component. You can find all these details about the ribosomal RNA in the intro video of this translation playlist. This 23S ribosomal RNA specifically pairs with both transfer RNAs at the P and A site, and it recognizes the CCA sequence in the transfer RNA at their 3' end. And this pairing further brings the P and A site transfer RNAs in close proximity. And this act of bringing them closer triggers the formation of a peptide bond between the amino acid on the P site transfer RNA with the amino acid of the tRNA on the A site. This pairing by 23S ribosomal RNA is thought to be mediated by adenines at position 76 and 2451. The important point here is to note that this peptide bond formation is an RNA catalyzed reaction. Let's actually flesh out the details of this peptide bond formation and see how the reaction works. For simplicity, I am only going to draw out the A site and the P site tRNAs. But here, our focus is on the amino acids and not the tRNA itself. And we also know that these amino acids are connected by the CCA at the 3' end of the tRNA. The dollar symbol in this is the sugar of the adenine base. And as we just said, the 23S ribosomal RNA brings the P and A site tRNAs close to each other. And this proximity causes the amine of the amino acid of the A site transfer RNA to attack the ester carbonyl carbon of the tRNA at the P site. And this causes a proton to shuttle across to the second carbon of the sugar of the P site transfer RNA. The big important point in this is to note that the amine attacks the ester carbonyl carbon. And just to fill in the gaps, the CCA on both of these transfer RNAs is in contact with the 23S ribosomal RNA. And this mechanism of shuttling a proton from the amino acid to the second carbon on the sugar is called a proton shuttle mechanism. This is also sometimes known as the eight-member proton shuttle. And this reaction is a model mechanism that leads to the peptide bond formation. There are more details on this mechanism, but I will not go in more detail here. But I would like to point out that the proton shuttle is the most supported of the two models that researchers have discovered to describe this peptide bond formation. Here's a snapshot of these two models. The other not so widely accepted mechanism is the proton wire model, which invokes the involvement of water molecules in the proton transfer. Regardless of how this works, the final product is the same. And this entire reaction is catalyzed by the help of 23S ribosomal RNA. And this is also the reason why it's also called entropic catalysis, where the activation energy is increased through proximity of the substrates. And this completes the peptidyl transferase reaction. And now we can draw out the products of this reaction. We see that the amino acid of the P site transfer RNA is now moved to the A site transfer RNA. So you've got the amino acid 2 from the A site, and you have this first amino acid from the P site transfer RNA. In this case, the first amino acid is just 4 mile methionine. So this is the A site tRNA. The P site tRNA now is no longer connected with any amino acid because it just got transferred to the A site. And as we just saw that the proton was transferred to the third carbon of the sugar. And now just to be explicit, the two amino acids are connected by a peptide bond. And this here is the peptide bond. And we can now complete this picture and you will notice that the E site is still empty. And all this reaction occurred in the 50S large subunit and this was facilitated by the 23S ribosomal RNA. Now, because the amino acid from the P site transfer RNA got transferred to the A site transfer RNA, the P site tRNA changes its conformation in such a way that it rotates a bit, and this rotation 
makes it poised or ready to move into the E site. All right, let's first simplify this sketch a bit. So following the peptidyl transferase reaction, the amino acid 1 and 2 are linked with the A site tRNA. So suddenly there are two amino acids that are sitting at the A site. And the A site is not large enough to accommodate two amino acid. But there is an exit channel for the amino acid chain to exit the ribosome as the chain gets longer. And this channel is part of the 50S subunit. And conveniently, this channel is located close to the P site. So by default, as the chain of amino acid gets longer on the tRNA on the A site, it wants to move to the P site because that's where the exit channel is. And as we just said that the tRNA from the P site, because of its rotation, wants to move to the E site. And this state where naturally the transfer RNAs are ready to translocate, but there is no energy source for them to actually move, is called a hybrid state of the transfer RNAs. Now it is at this stage that another elongation factor enters the process. And this is elongation factor G, which also carries a GTP with itself. And this elongation factor also binds the docking region, just like the EFTU. And just as the elongation factor G binds the docking site, the 30S subunit rotates. Now A site is occupied by a transfer RNA, which has two amino acids. And the docking site is bound by the EFG. And this causes a bit of congestion. And to release this sort of congestion, the 50S subunit tries to move forward. And this is done in order to make space at the A site. And as it tries to move forward, the BL12 protein cleaves a phosphate bond in the GTP that is attached with the elongation factor G. And when this GTP is hydrolyzed, the 70S complex transitions into the next stage, which is the translocation stage. And because this 50S subunit tried to move forward, the 30S subunit now also tries to move forward in order to catch up with the 50S subunit. And in this process, it rotates back into its original position. And because of this movement, the ribosome now has moved by one codon or three bases, such that the three bases at the P site are now moved to the E site. And therefore, the tRNA, which was at the P site, has also now moved to the E site. And the codon from A site moved to the P site. And likewise, the connected transfer RNA is also moved to the P site. Remember that the amino acids are also connected to the same tRNA. This amino acid chain now has the chance to enter the exit channel. And as this chain grows and gets bigger, it won't be congested inside the ribosome. Now this movement in 30S that tries to catch up with the 50S doesn't just happen by itself. It is catalyzed by the conformational change in the elongation factor G after the GTP is reduced to GDP. This conformational change in the elongation factor kicks the tRNA from A site to the P site. And as a consequence, the 70S ribosome complex translocates by one codon. So following this translocation, when the conformation of the EFG changes, the EFG GDP complex is released simply because this new conformation has less affinity towards the docking region. And following this translocation step, even the transfer RNA at the E site, which is not bound by any amino acid, is released as well. Transfer RNAs with no amino acids have less affinity towards the ribosome, so they are just released from the exit site. So in our new sketch of this translocated 70S complex, we see that the P site is occupied by the transfer RNA, which has the amino acid chain in the exit channel. And the E site is empty again. And the A site now is also empty. And nothing is bound at the docking region. Recall that this is exactly the type of situation where we were at the beginning with the 70S initiation complex. Except that the P site was occupied in the 70S initiation complex with the initiator tRNA. Which means that this elongation complex is now ready for the next codon to be bound by the next transfer RNA at the A site. And the EFTU will bring that next transfer RNA. Now before we end our discussion, I wanted to give you a key insight into the energetics of this elongation step. So how much energy is used to make one peptide bond and move the ribosome to the next codon? The first source of expenditure is in the form of ATP which comes from the charging of the amino acid. 
you should definitely watch the tRNA charging video for details on that. And the other source of expenditure is from the two elongation factors which carry GTPs. And we use two GTP molecules as the energy source. So this one cycle of elongation for making one peptide bond and moving the ribosome requires one ATP and two GTP molecules. So now if this ribosome wants to continue moving forward to the next codon, the amino acid chain will progressively get longer and longer through the peptidyl transferase reaction. And following translocation, the next codon will be read and another peptidyl reaction will happen. And this cycle of elongation will continue until a stop codon is encountered by the ribosome. And when that happens, the ribosome terminates the process of translation. And we will discuss the termination of translation in the next video.